Hi, my name is Aiden Alvarez, and today we'll be reviewing the case of George Metesky, also known as the Mad Bomber. This case is especially relevant to criminal justice due to the fact that it was one of the first cases in which a forensic psychologist used a criminal profile to aid in the capture of said criminal. Get into a little bit of background about the Mad Bomber. From 1940 to 1956, approximately 16 years, George Metesky claimed to have planted 54 bombs throughout New York City, though only 32 were actually discovered by law enforcement. Of those 32, only 22 detonated. These bombs were often found in various public locations in New York City, oftentimes in phone booths, lockers, and garbage cans. Some notable places in which they were placed include the Grand Central Station, Radio City Music Hall, and the New York City Public Library. Within those 16 years, George Metesky ended up minorly injuring about 24 people, with only three major injuries. Photographed to the left are some of Metesky's homemade bombs. They often consisted of a steel pipe packed with gunpowder and rigged with a very simple fuse. I know what you're thinking, 16 years without catching this guy? How did that happen? Let's get into that. Let's start with a timeline. In 1903, George Metesky is born in Waterbury, Connecticut. Following World War I, he decides to enlist with the U.S. Marine Corps. He joins as an ordnance mechanic, and it's here that he learns how to make bombs. Following his tour with the Marine Corps, he returns back to Connecticut to work at a power plant owned and operated by Consolidated Edison. In the midst of the Depression, in 1931, Metesky claims to receive injuries at the power plant. He says that these have resulted in tuberculosis and he can't work anymore. After three failed applications to receive workman's compensation from Consolidated Edison, Metesky decides to get his revenge. On November 16th, 1940, a bomb is discovered inside of a Con Ed building in New York City. Alongside with a note that reads, Con Edison Crooks, this is for you. A year later, another bomb is discovered in a Con Ed building with no note and not exploded. Following the attacks on Pearl Harbor, Metesky sends a letter to NYPD claiming he'll halt his placement of bombs until the duration of World War II is over. His next bomb is not found until March 29th of 1950, again unexploded, but this time in Grand Central Station. However, in the next month, he does find success in the detonation of a bomb, this time in New York City's public library, hidden within a phone booth. Luckily, no one was injured. Metesky then goes on for the next five years to plant 30 more bombs and injured in total about 27 people, three of them being majorly injured. From 1956 to 1957, the NYPD then instate a citywide manhunt to find the man that calls himself FP. This ultimately leads to the assistance of a forensic psychologist to help determine who FP is. George Metesky was obsessed with the notoriety of being the Mad Bomber. He oftentimes sent letters to the New York City Police Department, as well as various journals and newspapers throughout NYC. To the left, you could see the note in which he wrote to the NYPD, claiming to halt his bombs during the duration of the war. He says, his patriotic feelings bring me to decide this. Later, I will bring the Con Edison to justice. They will pay for their dastardly deeds. Those last two words are eventually what will bring Metesky to his knees. It is believed that the letters and their corresponding bombs were created to inspire the New York City residents to revolt against Con Edison. In December of 1956, one of Metesky's bombs went off in Paramount Theater in Brooklyn and ended up injuring six people out of 1,500 occupants. It's this bomb that leads the NYPD to seek help from a forensic psychologist. Dr. James Brussel a criminal psychiatrist at a Greenwich Village, New York, develops the first ever criminal profile of George Metesky. Utilizing 16 years worth of evidence, hundreds of letters, and his own criminal psychology background, he determined likely criteria for the perpetrator. Dr. Brussel believed that the individual was single, probably stocky in his 40 to 50s, introverted and a paranoid schizophrenic. He likely lives alone or with a female relative, most likely in Connecticut, He's probably a skilled mechanic and an immigrant from Central and Eastern Europe. He also believed he would likely be wearing a button double-breasted suit. This idea was prompted by the fact that F.P. Metesky was very particular in how he wrote his letters and the nuances within those letters. NYPD then took this description 
and posted it in the New York City American Journal in hopes that FP would reveal himself. Luckily, it did just that. Metesky responds to this posting by sending letters to the journal and NYPD explaining his hatred for Con Ed. In doing so, he details his injury and the year in which he was injured. By cross-referencing the year in which Metesky claimed he was injured, 1931, with the records from Con Ed in 1931, the police department is able to determine that the most likely perpetrator was George Metesky of Waterbury, Connecticut. On January 21st, 1957, George Metesky was finally apprehended. Upon arrival at his door for questioning, they noticed that Metesky was a stocky individual with egotistical personality, not married, living with two sisters, appeared to be of Slavic background, and when asked to change clothes to go to the police station for questioning, George Metesky came out in a double-breasted suit with the buttons even buttoned. It was almost as if Dr. Brussel knew George Metesky was FP, which FP was later found to stand for fair play. Metesky was then later charged with 47 separate crimes, including seven accounts of attempted murder. Fortunately, Metesky never stood trial as he was found and diagnosed a paranoid schizophrenic. He then spent 16 years in a psychiatric facility for the criminally insane. In 1973, he was released back to his home in Connecticut, where he spent the last 20 years of his life till he died at the age of 90. In the end, the description that Dr. Russell gave in regards to George Metesky turned out to be 100% accurate. At this time, criminal profiling seemed like a progressive way in order to catch criminals. However, Dr. Russell knew that this would not be the case for everyone. In his book, The Casebook of a Crime Psychiatrist, he warns future forensic psychologists, claiming that criminal profiling is not a science, but an art that relies on as much on common sense and general knowledge as it does physiological or psychiatric expertise. Criminal profiles sometimes create a kind of tunnel vision that leads investigators to erroneous conclusions and thus delay rather than advance the investigation. This was even true in the case of George Metesky. After the posting of the description of FP, Hundreds of calls were made into the NYPD, many claiming that their neighbors, significant others, and various other peoples in their lives were thought to be the Mad Bomber. Many of these ended up being dead ends, not leading the police to George Metesky, FP himself. This case is a great demonstration on the criminally insane and the use of criminal profiling by forensic psychologists. Although criminal profiling can be a great tool to help catch a criminal, it tends to be hard work and true tedious investigative practices that lead to the arrest of many criminals. With that, I conclude my presentation of George Metesky, the Mad Bomber. I appreciate you for listening and thank you for being here. The following slides are just some references.